So there's some players who want to know what's coming, and then there's some players like, don't tell me. Don't don't tell me. Were you like were you a guy? Did oh, you... tell me every time. <laughs> tell you every time. Hey, tell why do you me. think some guys? Why are some guys? As soon like, as I, I don't see you know. signal fastball to me, I'm swinging right now. <laughs> he hadn't even thrown it yet. And I'm swinging, buddy. I'm coming. Let's go. Uh... looking at your path and, and how you got into baseball and you did some badass things like you changed your name you had to do some stuff to where I like did. like you schemed your you schemed it up not <laughs> exactly. like schemed it up in a bad way <laughs> you but like you're like i'm gonna did. get in there i'm gonna find a way I in there did. and when i do i'm gonna stick i'm gonna get in there and i'm gonna stick and like someone's gonna yeah. gonna hire me and they're gonna see the value i have and how good i am and all that and you know you've been to a lot of different places. I know you went to the Netherlands, you studied out there, worked with Driveline, been with a couple different organizations, uh, had a couple different roles too. And that's something now, not playing anymore, I'm trying to see, you know, is there a role for me in the front office? Where would I fit in the best? So give me some of that, like, school me on that game a little bit, how that all works, <laughs> what you found you like, you know, I'm sure you like to be on the field and all that type of stuff, but you've done all that stuff, so. You just asked me like 10 questions, so <laughs> I'm take it. You got this. You got this. Bring it down. You got this. First of all, I definitely, it was definitely a scheme. <laughs> so the Rachel to Ray part, that's the. Yeah. Do you have a sister by chance? No. no. Do you have a, a niece? He has a niece. niece. Man, do you have a crazy older sister? Does anyone have a crazy I have a older younger sister. sister. I have a younger sister. So I have a crazy older sister. And um, I was like having a lot of trouble getting into baseball at first. And I mean, you know, and like both of you know, it's like there were no women in sight, you know, in 2012, there's like no women around anywhere, no nutritionists, no sports scientists, like there was just nobody. Right. And I was having a ton of trouble. And like, it was so, um, it was so accepted that people would just be like, oh no, sorry. Like we don't hire women for those positions. And I'd be like, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> like, okay. Like I was so, it was so accepted to just not hire women. And so I was talking to my crazy older sister and I was like, I had been getting like blatantly discriminated against openly. And I was talking to her and she was like, that, why don't you just change your name? And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, just change your name on your resume and see like if someone will actually interview you. And I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> and I was like, could I do that? Could I do that? And so, I mean, it worked like a fucking charm. Yes. Yeah, as, as soon as I changed my name and started applying for things, it was like, hey, Ray, like, we'd really, you know, we'd love to, like, get, interview you, did this. So it was, like, a lot of email responses. And then finally one day, I had, like, three, four email responses. And I was like, it worked. It worked. <laughs> like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, I didn't know what to do with my hands. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, why? Okay, now I know. And it was strangely a bit of a confidence boost because I was like, okay, it's not it's not me. It's not, it's not like my resume. Cause I had a very good resume for a young coach at the time. Right. And I had been at LSU for a couple of years and like just good resume. And I was starting to get worried. I'm like, what's going on? And I was like, Oh, phew. like, Oh, I'm just being discriminated against. It's fine. So anyway, <laughs> it's one fine. day, <laughs> yeah, one day I get a phone call and I was like out and about and I'll never forget. I was out, out and about in Phoenix and I get a phone call. And I answer the phone and the guy was like, yeah, uh, I'm looking for Ray. And I was like, I was like, uh, uh, this is, this is she, this is she. Play cool, play cool, be cool. <laughs> and he was like, you could just hear like shuffling of papers in the background. And he's like, oh, I'm just sorry. I'm just trying to make sure I have the right name. And I was like, uh, okay. It was super awkward and uncomfortable. And I, I couldn't talk at the time. I was like, hey, like love to set up a time. He never got back to me. He had given me his name and the organization. So I like emailed him to follow up, never got back to me. So all this was to say, I, I changed my name. It was pretty short lived because I felt so awkward. And I eventually decided to be like, you know what, fuck it. If, I, if they don't want to hire a woman, I probably don't want to work for them, you know? Love that. So anyway, it was a scheme cooked up by my crazy older sister. I'm sorry that you guys can't experience that. <laughs> a crazy older sister. You. Yeah, um, that's, do yeah. um, so you guys, like Alyssa Nakin, do you keep in contact yeah. with her at San Francisco? I, I've definitely talked to her, but that, it's it's kind of crazy. Like there's there's actually a handful of women now. So like, I don't actually know all of them very well, but yeah, yeah, yeah. there was a point so, in time where I knew everyone. Oh, I bet, I bet, I bet that community's strong. And Alyssa, so this is, I was with San Diego, I think it's like 22 or 23 or whatnot. And Antoine Richardson is the first base coach. I think Alyssa's handling like the outfield and doing the alignment and stuff. 
And Antoine gets into it with our third base coach. They throw him out of the game. So Alyssa comes on the field yeah. and that was, you know, first time on the field, all that. So I'm like, man, this is cool. And my niece, like you mentioned, she's she's five. So she's watching the games with my brother. And, you know, it like unlocked these these whole new like dreams with her. Like she she loved it. Like she all she wanted to talk about was Eric, I saw you on the field with Alyssa and all this. And it's so funny, like an inning later, uh, no, this is probably like three or four innings later, we're getting crushed. It's like eight to two. And one of their guys on the team drops a bunt down. And you know, that's like, that's bad form. You're up, yeah. it's eight to two. Yeah. Like you don't, don't bunt on a guy like that, whatever. So he gets the first and I'm like, bro, like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, you can't bunt right now. Like what? Like, <laughs> and he's just like, hey man, like, look, I'm a, I'm a triple A guy, I'm up and down. Like, I gotta do it to save my job. They told me to do it. And we just keep going back and forth. And I was just like, hey guys, knock it off, let's play the game. I'm like, she's a badass, dude. <laughs> yes, dude. And I, ever so since awesome. that, I'm like, okay, she she belongs here. She definitely belongs here. That's but awesome. yeah, that's cool. I'm sure you guys all keep in contact. That's yeah. awesome. So what was the first or, first organization that you signed with in affiliate ball was? The Cardinals. The Cardinals. Mm -hmm. What was that first year like? Because that was at that time, like now, obviously it's, it's it's as you say, the populace getting more popular women yeah. in different positions. But you, that first year, what was that well, like? Let me tell you about my first day. <laughs> yeah, let's hear about that. <laughs> let me, let's just zoom in to the first day. I'm so excited, you know? I show up and I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm in professional baseball. And uh, <laughs> my boss was like, hey, you wanna come to like the coaches meeting, you know, because every, every morning all the coaches meet together. I was like, yeah, of course I do. So I go and he's like, you know, my, my boss is in there and we're about to start the meeting. Um, and he's like, hey, you know, I, I'd like to introduce our new strength coach. And I stand up and I'm like, my name's Rachel. I'm so excited to be here. No, not like that, but I was like, I'm so pumped. I sit down and one of the senior coaches at the time, I'll try to like, the names aren't important or anything. I, I don't hold, he's like a mentor of mine now, but one of the senior coaches at the time was like, all right, everybody, we need to talk about this. And I was like, what are we gonna talk about? Like, I'm so excited. He was like, no cussing around her. No, we, we gotta be really careful what we say. You know, like she could, she could get us all fired in a, in a second. We're gonna have to tell all the players, no cussing, no cussing in the weight room. I don't wanna hear any. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, don't you, shouldn't you talk about this behind my back? Like, <laughs> like, I'm, you know, like, right. I'm sitting you. right yeah. here, <laughs> you know? And so I was like, I was so mad, of course. And like, I'm, I cuss like a sailor. And I'm like, this guy has no idea who he's talking to. So I'm like, I'm getting so mad. My face was red, I remember. And I like, I put my head down, you know, I like put, literally I remember I like put my head down like this. Cause I was like, I'm not listening to this. And he was like going on and on and on. And I was like, how is this happening? And I'm just like, this is, this is insane. So I like look up and I catch the eye of another senior coach. who's also like a long time mentor of mine now. I catch his eye and he's staring right at me. And I'm like, this guy hates me. Like this, these people hate me. Like, what am I doing here? And he's like, finally, like he's looking at me and he's like, Jesus Christ, you're making her blush. And I was like, what? I'm like, what's happening right now? And he's like, is this meeting over or what? What are we talking about? And he stands up and just leaves and, and ended the meeting right there. And I was like, what? Like, and everyone just didn't know what to do. And so they all just stood up and left. And the like, boat, my that was your first yeah. meeting. <laughs> that was my first ever, like literally first 30 minutes of my first day in professional baseball. Wow. And it got, it got better from there. So we we're all good. But it just was like this moment in time where people were having to decide like how they were going to feel about women in the game. And obviously it was, it's like when you're the epicenter of change, it took me a long time to get to this place, but I was like, you just drop change in the middle of a room and you can't expect everyone to just be like, Oh, okay, cool. Everything's fine. My iPhone updated yesterday. And I got pissed off. Like change is change. And so that moment I will never forget of like, one guy was like, oh my God, this is gonna ruin my life, you know? And another guy was like, what are we talking about? Who cares? Like, move on. And it was just this beautiful moment. And both of them ended up being like great mentors over time. Um, but yeah. yeah, that was my first day. That's, that's what's amazing. Now, did you experience those types of changes? Then you go to the hitting coach, then you're a oh, manager. Yeah. And yeah. That, did, was it always difficult every new position? Um, hitting coach was still difficult. And then something really weird happened in the world, like society like shifted, right? And so it was, 
when I was a strength coach, I always like to say, like, when I got hired as a strength coach, nobody cared. Like, there was no social media, no celebrating women, and nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So, like, no one, there's like no media. And then when I got hired as a hitting coach, it was this like really controversial moment in time. And then when I was hired as a manager, it was like, yay, women. Like, this whole progression over time. Mm. And I've been really fortunate to, I think, experience like different layers of it. So we're like, what about the baseball side? Going from a strength coach to a hitting coach, yeah, completely different battles. It's like strength coach, Joey Greeny, good friend of ours. Like I'm going in the weight room, I'm getting a good lift in. I know like he's a he's good energy. It's a different conversation to get me away from getting in my head, anything like yeah. that. But hitting coach, I'm coming in the cage. I'm like, Rachel, I do not know what I'm doing right now. Like, we need to figure, we got about 30 minutes and we got to figure out what we're going to do for these five at-bats today. So that is like, I mean, that's a whole nother game for you right there. I feel like that transition. We, you think that transition, I'm sorry for asking you so many questions, but I'm interested. <laughs> uh, it's almost like that transition was almost maybe easier than being the hitting coach to the manager. Um. So... Not, not doesn't seem like you, but right. like most, a lot of people hate the strength coach, right? Because the strength coach is the person who makes them do things that they don't want to do, right. which is lifting and running and, you know, all those things. And the transition was so, like such a jolt when I went to being a hitting coach because everyone was to hit yeah. forever. Yes. You know, like they don't want to be in the cages. It's like the, the place that you go. And so that was actually kind of refreshing. Um, it was a, It was a tough transition, but like, just like any other change or transition, I think it wasn't more than any of that. And I had like a ton of support from the coaches with the Yankees. So it was relatively like, I would say smooth. Going to a manager was was maybe a little bit more difficult, like the zooming out and having right. to see a hundred, seemingly a hundred things at once, which is funny because I was in the Florida State League. So there's like no pressure, no fans, no one cares. And I'm like freaking out. Like the first couple of weeks, I'm like, oh my God, there's so much happening. <laughs> Whereas like, yeah, obviously being a hitting coach is just one thing. I almost like forget sometimes the rest of the game's going on. Yeah, it's just like that jump though. The strength to, to hitting is a huge jump to me, but manager, that's, yeah, that's another level. Did you get tossed at all? I did a couple oh, yeah. times. <laughs> yeah, well, a couple <laughs> times. I love yeah, that. I mean, honestly, couple like, times. I'm really, I, I think that was like a weakness of mine as a manager at times, but it's like, especially at the lower levels, I, I will go straight to like, don't blame the umpires. And so I would like never wanted to get tossed that much because I didn't want to give them an excuse. Right. You know, for not, there's so many things in the game that we could have done better and controlled a lot better. And what maybe that was a hustle play or whatever. And so I was just trying to focus on like what we can control with those younger guys. And I, I found myself not wanting to argue with the umpire because they would constantly argue with the umpire. Yeah. Um, after they let a pitch go right down the middle and then like <laughs> argue about one, you know, on the black. So I was like more, Hey, let's you know control what we can control. I like that. Any what would get you tossed? Like what would what would make you? So like I strikes? was. So I'm at first, and the umpire is gonna have the plate the next day. So like, some of the guys like to have a conversation on first. Some of the guys aren't aren't really about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of these younger guys, like they, the younger umpires would come up and they want to have a chip on their shoulder. So they really wouldn't like conversate back and forth. So I'm older and bitter at this point. I'm like, oh, this guy ain't gonna talk to me? Okay, okay, like, I get it, all right. So like, I don't know if I was sniffing it the next day, but as soon as they would call like a bad pitch on me, I would start chirping. And if there was a couple more, then I was probably gone. But <laughs> yeah, biggest thing too, like as a hitter, you just want that consistent zone. So like, when they go outside of it, I feel like hitters think like, he knows he's going outside the zone, but he's just <laughs> trying to get me, you know what I mean? <laughs> But, oh man, I'm happy for you that you weren't my hitting coach because <laughs> I would have drove you nuts. I'm a disaster, dude. I'm like, hey, what are we gonna do today, you know? Now, what do you think then about the auto zone since you're, since you were so, just talking about the umpires? My fear about the auto zone, and I will say this. Okay, here we I, go, here I think, we go. Yep, I think we yep. need umpires. I think there should be a select amount of umpires that just do the plate. Like Pat Holberg is a gangster back there. Like he needs to do every other day. Like even if he has, uh, an extra off day in there. I need him, you know, majority of the time. My fear with the automatic strike zone is these pitchers are so good that like they can bounce a curveball and it can clip the bottom of the zone. Now I know technology is amazing and they'll be able to, to figure that out and all that. 
But a way, a lot of these pitchers are talking about, oh, we can figure this out and it's good, you know? So, and I don't like taking the human element out that much. I think that'll be a lot of excitement that gets out of the game, you know? What's your but, opinion on it, Rachel? Yeah, you guys did it in the minor leagues, yeah. right? Yeah, we had it. Yeah, yeah a lot. Of, there'll be a, a, a significantly less arguing. So if you like to see arguing and you like yeah. to argue, then yeah, you, that would be frustrating. I want to see old school managers kicking dirt in the umpire. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see that, oh, the auto zone will definitely take some of that out. Yeah. But it's like there's there's definitely we felt more advantages because it, it keeps. I mean, it keeps umpires honest or it keeps the zone honest, and so mm. at least you you know. And there are there are those exceptions like right. where you just feel like you get you know because of the auto zone. But that yeah. was overall, it seemed like a positive. And was this when the hitter could challenge too, or that mm -hmm. was oh it was we had challenges, yeah. How many and that was even better. Like that was it was it's so, so you three. have oh, okay. so you would have six challenges or something. I yeah. might be getting this wrong. Three on either side. Yeah. Yeah, but if a guy gets it wrong, you lose one as a team. So oh, like yeah. if a guy goes up there and does it twice and gets it wrong, no yeah. one's gonna no, no one's gonna sorry. love that. It's three total. Yeah, it's three total for like offense, like mm. for the pitchers, they can challenge and then oh, the hitters, oh, wow, it's three total. Even, it changes it big. That, yeah. Which big. is actually great, again, because if like, if a hitter challenges like a dumb pitch, then, you know, the pitchers are like, the f yeah, like, yeah, stop, yeah. you know, like, yeah, yeah. like, it's just like a, um, teammates keep each other accountable, which yeah. is always cool to see, so. Need more of that team being accountable. Yeah, sure. yeah. It, that, that will get people pissed off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the pitch clock sped things up. I think it it definitely cleaned up the game in a way of we don't need to be out there for four and a half hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you struggled with it at first in the yeah, spring, spring training. <laughs> yeah, you did bring that up. I got rung up in spring one time. You sound so mature. Oh, you just had to kill that. God. You just had to kill that. I one. was so mad. So like I was under the impression that both feet had to be in the box by seven and by seven seconds. But the rule is both feet in the box and you have to be like making eye contact ready to go with the pitcher. Yeah. So I was, my feet were in the box and I wasn't doing that. And oh, here we go. they rang me up. I'm like, my feet were in the box. What are you talking about? He's like, no, you got to look at it. And I'm like, maybe we should have had a meeting about this in spring, <laughs> but we're just winging it. The, the long spring this year helped so much because I think like you got to get used to it and all that, but it was an adjustment. That's so true. It was an adjustment. <laughs> Do you have any stories of a player or players you had to win over? I think it's I think it's more similar to any coach than you would think. It's probably just a you know, any any male person, any male can walk into a room and there's a possibility they might have played professional baseball. Even if like now obviously in the game there's plenty of like there's there's candidates coming from private facilities that didn't play or whatever. There's, there's plenty of different candidates. But if they're male, you might assume that it's possible, right? And so I, I walk in the room, it's very clear to not play professional baseball. So it's like, a, I don't get the credit right up front, but I earn it just like anybody else would, you know? And and I take pride in that. Like, I like, mm -hmm. I'm like, good. Like, any respect that I've ever gotten, I earned it. No one just like gave it to me as soon as they saw me and I was like some huge dude that walked in the room with tattoos and a beard, no offense. Do you have tattoos? No tattoos. You okay. said everything Beard. about tattoos, yeah, so I'm good. Beard. Yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, so a guy walks in the room with looking like he played and like, boom, gets respect. Yeah. But I'm like, cool. Anybody that respects me, I earned that myself. And that that's like a point of pride. Being a manager, what a lot of people don't understand is also you're the leader of that coaching staff. Was it a difficult, was that a difficult adjustment to not just working with players, but also being like a leader of the staff. It's the same same process, you know, and I think like I've had so many great mentors and I just view them, especially, I should say both years. I mean, I don't think I was ever like the greatest manager in the world. You can't do that in two years, right? So I had a lot of people helping me and I was really grateful for that. And so again, just earning respect over time by listening and I don't, I don't know if I was really, especially some of the staff members, like you said, that have been around much longer. I don't know if I was really leading them. Like I, I would like to think they were mentoring me and I'm okay with that. Like, I don't, you know, cool. I don't need to have a hand over everybody. We were talking uh, before you showed up and the question we were, we were wondering is, who are some of uh, your champions? Who are some of the people who you really supported you through your journey in professional baseball that you can look and say, you, you've been mentioning a lot of mentors. Like mm -hmm. it seems, it sounds like you like to you, the, the mentorship. But who are these people who really supported you? So because it's a positive thing, I'll tell you the guy who stood up in the room the very first day of my career. That's Brent Strom. 
So the oh, the pitching current, coach, he's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah current time. major league pitching coach for the Diamondbacks. Um, he's a, he's an absolute unicorn. Like I'm so grateful. You know, he's I don't know, he's got to be in his 70s now, and and he is still. I mean, like to this day, he'll like send me a research article, and be like, "Rach, you seen this one?" And you're just like, "What? How are you?" He's he's such a a lifelong learner, literally. And I mean, that guy had no reason to give me the time of day. I mean, he was like, I always joke, he was the second guy ever to have Tommy John. So he's, he's that old. Like, I'm like, damn, <laughs> hey, you are old. You're right I'm like, Tommy, you are old. It was Tommy and then you. I'm like, could have been Stromy John. You just really, <laughs> just really <laughs> missed him. Jeez. Oh, Stromy, so, yeah. Like, he's like, he has so much time in the game, so much experience. He had no reason to give me any time of day and like just stood up for me the first day he ever even saw me. And then I remember the first time he came to visit the affiliate I was at and he was like, Rage, like, come, with, come with me to the bullpen. I want to talk to you about like pelvis rotation. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like he did not give two f that I was a woman from the very beginning. He didn't even think about it. Wow, and he's just been like, he's, how do you know, time? So he was pitching coach for, for Houston. He was with Arizona when I was in San Diego. Loves the high fastball. That's his thing. He's <laughs> yeah. like, get ahead and throw that fastball high. Make him get on top of it. Yeah. So you know what's funny too? Uh, I played at American Heritage down here. Our softball team was gangster. They were good. And we had a girl, <laughs> her name was Stephanie Brombacher. Okay. And she was going to Florida. She was she was a pitcher. She was like number one in the state. Like she was the real deal. You faced her rise ball? Oh my God. <laughs> and, like, and literally like these new VA heaters these yeah. dudes are throwing. Yeah. I'm like, this is Stephanie Brombacher. And she gassed me up. She hit me with like, <laughs> like a rise ball and I swung through it. And I'm like, yeah. throw that again. But we would always do these fun games and all that. But that to me is the, is the closest thing to these yeah. new like heaters are throwing now. Um, so to get all like hitting nerd, that, that type of mode, I know you went to driveline. I feel like driveline, they're ahead of the game on pitching. And I know the hitting side of it's really coming up. Uh, was that just to kind of learn the body movements or like, what was some of the stuff from hitting you picked up there? Um, so I'm gonna tell like a little bit longer story. The, the reason why I was at driveline. Um, all right, so I was a strength coach with the Astros. At the time there was a minor league hitting coach named Dylan Lawson who um, then became the hitting coordinator for the Yankees. Mm -hmm. Dylan was like a huge mentor of mine there as well. Like he, I was always in places where I shouldn't be as a strength coach. Like I would just look at the schedule and be like, all right, like hitting's having a medium and I go there pitching, scouting, like I was always just like <laughs> bouncing around, which I should have known at that point that I was like gonna, you know, I was like gonna grow out of that. So as, as a strength coach, I like popped into a meeting um, with Dylan, he was holding with the hitters and they were doing pitch recognition videos. So I don't know how much you ever used that in your career, but like basically they would show a video of a pitcher and it would cut off like right here and it, they would like rec be recognizing this, this, mm -hmm. you know, like seeing the grips out of hand and it would cut off and the hitters would have to like write down what pitch they saw. And I was like, like, I was like, I've never even like thought of this. I played division one college softball. I didn't even think about like where you look, recognizing the hand, yeah. what that looks like. And I was just so interested. And so then he starts feeding me like research articles and there's like decades of research in like eye tracking and seeing how, how hitters recognize pitches. Right. Um, it's in tennis, it's in cricket and baseball. It's like decades and decades of research. And I'd never even like thought of the concept. So, Anyway, that uh, I would say that snowballed pretty quickly because then a year later, I, I no, excuse me, two years later, I ended up quitting my job, getting rid of my car, moving to Europe with three suitcases, and I studied for a year under the leading researcher in the world for eye tracking. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a year of coursework there, studying like basically eyeballs in the brain for like a year, and then I completed my research for that at Driveline. So Driveline hitting was like really in its infancy, but I wasn't right. even there for that. I was actually studying. Like I was using eye tracking glasses um, on live hitters facing live pitchers and tracking their eye movements and Basically like evaluating. How early they can recognize that hand, if you can train to make that better at some yeah. point or something like that. Yes, so the training component is like a huge piece of it. But then that's why the Yankees hired me and Dylan was like one of my mentors with the Astros, I would say. Like we kind of say I was his Frankenstein. He kind of like put me together as a hitting coach and then hired me into rookie ball. It's crazy because like, when I was in the minor leagues, it was like, just get your flips in and make sure you're ready to go. And like, there was no like yeah. classes, like there was no, there's so much more to offer a minor league player now mm -hmm. that the development, I think that's why we got these guys coming up at 19 or 20. And yeah. 
that's going to be big for you now with the Marlins. You know, that's uh, <laughs> that's kind of your role now because I know uh, John Jay, Skip, those yeah. are cool. They're yeah. they're good friends of mine, but you know, they're what they did to that big league team last year is unreal. And I know now they want that to trickle down to the minor league. Yeah. So that's going to be really some cool. Fun like stuff. Skip is super passionate about player development, which is mm-hmm. something you don't always get. Um, with a major league manager so it's pretty cool skips awesome and like we were talking about like your path his path to being a manager like i was telling sua earlier he could have got hired two years before he did but it's almost like he wanted to make sure he was more than ready yeah so to see him get the you know manager of the year this year and just like the team ball out when no one expected it that was so cool to see but sua knows that yeah. the mentality and and that process is that's huge the clubhouse is yeah. everything i mean He's, speak of- we had a great conversation. It was so funny. Yeah. We, so oh we, we spoke, uh, I can't remember how many, but probably a week or so, two weeks. I don't know when yeah, you December, got off. I was in Europe. So yeah, you were in Europe. And actually, that's interesting too. Why, tell us why you were in Europe. That, that was just fascinating when you t- when you called me and uh, we were talking. And I, I think my life is kind of like the secret life of Walter Mitty. <laughs> so, you know, I have like a kind of, well, I don't even really have a normal life, but I have like a job, you know, and then like, like get this itch. And then in the off season, I just like, fall off the face of the earth and go like, so I, I went to a small town, like a tiny little village in Slovenia, which for those people out there, maybe for you or you, I don't know. Yeah. It's um, north of Croatia. It's in between Croatia and Italy, but you've never heard of it, Yeah. which is why I went there yeah. <laughs> because I wanted something really quiet and I wanted somewhere where no one knows about baseball and doesn't want to talk about it. I don't have to see it, I don't think about it. So it just like really clears my mind. And then my last name is Slovenian, so. Just went there and like got in touch with my roots, hiked a lot and got quiet. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, yeah, like I'd meet people or we'd see people out or something and they'd be like, oh, you know, like, what do you do in the States? I'm like, oh yeah, like I coach in professional baseball. They're like, oh, cool. <laughs> so what do you want for dinner? Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. thank yeah, that's God. That's, that's yeah. awesome. It's so, so great. And now it got me thinking, you got the position, now you're director of player development for the Marlins. What is going to be, what's your vision for player development? Um, oh, man, it's a great one. You asked me at the very beginning, one of your first 10 questions was like- I was gonna say, I also asked you seven questions. Of yeah, somewhere in there was something like the, the vision for your career or something like if, like this was all planned, you know, like I've been planning this for a long time, I guess, Real, probably for like the past five or six years, my North Star was to be a general manager. And when I was at Driveline, I, thought I might get into the front office, but mm-hmm. the, the hitting coach job like came about. And realistically, I, I thought I might get in the front office earlier, but then I collected two more really critical experiences as a hitting coach and a manager. And so I think the vision for player development with the Marlins or just in general, my vision has been like to have a player focused model and really have like a holistic approach to using both like the on-field experience or like the traditional way and then also like the progressive way and like putting those together somehow. Mm. And so as we've seen in in baseball, really in like actually a lot of sports and just in industries in general, right? The pendulum swung really far at some point, maybe it's still over there, to like used to be very traditional coaches that were even coaching and then also in the front office and higher ranking positions and then like the nerds all came in, right? And like there was this big influx of like really new people, younger people, different backgrounds, all this thing. And so a lot of front office roles and leadership positions then became these people who had never been on the field or had never been a coach or been in a dugout. And so there's like leadership from that scope. And I think the vision is now to kind of like marry those two. And I think the pendulum is like swinging back towards the middle, which is what I kind of would like to do, right? Like I love Skip's philosophy of like, compete, like the, the focus is winning, compete, compete, like hardcore. He's a psycho, it's great, I love it. Gotta be a psycho to play this game. <laughs> or even manage. He, yeah, he's on another level in a great way. Like he's so intense yeah, yeah, and like yeah. wants to push people and like just compete, play the game the right way, phrases we've heard for a really long time. And then marrying that with also like new methods to, like you mentioned, there's so many improved ways to like give a player an idea of a really clear path of how they can improve yeah. and using those obje- that objective information to really make it clear and remove emotions from coaches who may or may not like you or whatever mm-hmm. the case is and using those methods combined with like, we'll call it the skip method of like the new and the old. 
So that was a really mm. long answer to, to say. No, I love it. Bring practicality and yeah. also like the newer methods as well. Now the people who are going to really put that in the action, coaches, mm -hmm. coordinators, yeah. and them are the people who you're hiring. What do you look for? You talked about you're now in a hiring frenzy. What <laughs> types of people are you, are you, what types of people do you want to hire? I mean, first and foremost, it's like just work ethic. I think that solves like so many problems, you know? So true. And so just like people who are really hungry and then I'm obviously of the mindset based off of my path, right? If you work your ass off, I will teach you, you know, or we have somebody here that can teach you hitting or pitching or whatever. Like if you are working extremely hard, then we'll figure out where to put you. And that's like, I think I could just stop there, honestly. Mm. But yeah, just, just work right now, it's just like hungry people. Yeah. And we'll figure out how to get you a skill set. That's, that's you were talking about how you have a treadmill in your office and you're trying this. <laughs> these are first time in ever you're not on the field. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And what, what are some of the biggest adjustments that you're noticing now in a, in a, in a role like this? Um, you know, what's funny. I don't know if I like I'm still going to probably identify as a coach for like ever. And I don't, I don't think I'm even gonna miss it because I'm gonna be coaching coaches and co like developing interns and developing whoever, whoever's with me. I hope that I'm just, I hope that I give off that coach vibe forever. So I don't think it's gonna change that much other than I'm not gonna be on a field moving around so I need the treadmill. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Steps in. like yeah. that's like the, the, yeah, the movement piece is something that I'm really like, is a part of my life. So that'll be tough, I think, but yeah. just, coaching and elevating people and finding out what their goals are. And I've already had so many great conversations with even just asking like um, more senior coaches, like, hey, what are your goals? And they're like, no one's asked me that. Cause you, you ask interns, hey, what are, what are your goals? <laughs> you, don't, you don't ask, you know, the senior coaches like, hey, what are your goals? And then one guy was like, yeah, I want to retire soon. I was like, great, let's get you retired, man. Like, let's <laughs> figure it out. So I think just like asking people what they want and and getting them to that end point, whatever that is for them, is still going to be a passion of mine forever. That's such a, that's so true. I think that's one of the most important questions. Like a question that really cuts through the noise is, what do you want? When you walk up to another person and say, what do you want? Mm -hmm. What are your goals? Especially coaches and like who they haven't paused to consider or even verbalized it to feel safe to verbalize it. Yeah. I think that's really powerful it's to a ask huge them. Thing. And then they see that, okay, let's get you, let's get you to do that. Or whether it be retired, get to the big leagues, whatever that may be. I think that's that's powerful. You know, it's so funny. It's such a great point that I want to bring up. And this is like a bit of a, you know, mental performance space is several of the responses. So I've been kind of like having one on ones with a lot, a lot of the coaches and coordinators and several of the responses are like, yeah, you know, like I know I'm not supposed to say, you know, that I want to do this or that I want to progress. You know, they don't they don't want to say like, oh, I want to be a major league coach. Like, I know I'm happy where I'm at and I don't want to say and I'm like, the f are you talking about like <laughs> say it and if you can't say it to your boss you're working for the wrong boss like what do you mean you should you should say what you want and tell people your goals if it feels comfortable and you want to share it and I've never understood that mentality and I like I got blasted for saying that I wanted to be a general manager I was hired when I was hired as a hitting coach blasted by like public public blasted you know yeah and I was like what what's wrong with you people you don't you don't say your goals <laughs> what you don't think that I want to like progress from a rookie league hitting coach I don't <laughs> <laughs> it's not the end of my career, I hope. That's, that's, I love that. So there's a study out of Harvard and they took these two yes. groups and uh, they Tell basically, yeah. so they took these two groups and it was in a school of management and they wanted to see the power of words. And they asked this one group, okay, there was a problem that both groups needed to be, that needed to solve, uh, the problem both groups needed to solve. One group had to answer the question, what should we do in this situation? And they had to come up with these different ideas. And then they asked the other group, what could we do in this situation? And they ended up finding and doing a thematic analysis on both groups. And they found that the group that had the question, what could we do? Not only did they have more ideas, more thinking outside the box ideas. They just, what could, what's <laughs> possible? They were able to look at possibilities. And the what should we do is they were using these frameworks like, like, what does my boss want me to do? Okay, what does the industry think we should do? What did people before us, uh, what did they do? And they had this like little box that they were thinking out of and they couldn't think big. And I love what you're yeah. doing. It's like, what do you want? It's like, what's possible? And oh, that's your man. whole life, that's your life. Like, what could I, oh. what could I do? And I, I, I love that. I and think then that's people so setting low goals. Like the, what you just said is yes. like, people will be like, oh, I think, you know, pitching coordinator. I'm like, I think you should be a general manager. They're like, what? 
I'm like, yeah, you just set a low goal for yourself. And they thought that was the biggest goal in their brain, which sometimes, you know, step by step. But I'm like, I don't think, I think you're putting a low ceiling on, on yourself. And they're just like, blows their mind, you know, like just, who cares? You, talking to the wrong person if you want to be like, oh, I don't know if I can do it. Like, I, I don't have any limitations for you. It, it, I love what you're saying. I mean, the name of this media company is Moonball. Like, and one of the big principles is taking moonshots. The odds of you being where you are and doing it so low. The odds of your career so low. And what I love is you guys have, um, you've been able to just broaden your circumference of luck. I heard this concept lately. Ooh, uh, a little bit. My gosh. Increase your circumference of luck, meaning that there's a lot of things you can't control. But you increase your circumference of luck, the odds of success happening by working hard, getting to know people, becoming competent, uh, doing everything you can to increase the odds and just being perseverance. And I just, it's so fascinating over the course of my career to sit with the best athletes in the world and hear them tell stories of like, yeah, I shouldn't be here, but they just shot for the moon. They went as hard as they could. And it's incredible. It's, it's, it's yeah. awesome. Some of those guys too, like I've played with a lot of these guys and they're preaching, you know, they have the outside of the box thinking and they're thinking something different that the organization doesn't really want them thinking. And it might not work out for that team, but they end up somewhere, they end up winning, they end up in a good yeah. organization and they end up in the right place, you know, instead of the guy that's like, I'm just going to do what they tell me here mm -hmm. and, and that's fine and that's good and all that. And you almost, I don't know, you don't want to have that regret at the end of the day, but you're definitely in a place now where, and, and this is crazy, but it's like some of the places people are afraid to be themselves at their job or do their job the way they could or they want. You know, they feel like people are looking a certain way, like, I don't want you teaching that way, I want you teaching this way, but that's what's going to be cool and I'm fired up for you because the Marlins is, I mean, you're going to be able to be yourself there and um, and, and Kapler's another one. I know he's doing some stuff in the minor leagues as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, the Cardinals and the Yankees, I'm jealous you got to wear pinstripes at some point in your life <laughs> and I didn't. Uh, but, I mean, those are two big time organizations and now getting to work with these guys. So that's gonna be cool. Yeah, I was gonna ask that same question that Sue asked too, what he already did about like some of those mentors because of those organizations, like those guys, I mean, the Cardinals, the way they, they developed for, I mean, a good 20 year stretch. And still now they've been one of the top organizations for a long time. And then the Yankees are the Yankees, you know, that's going to be. Yeah. Houston I mean, was pretty formative as well. Like the. Oh yeah. Houston. Yeah, yeah. That's. That was pretty, that was like my teenage years of like my career where I was like forming thoughts a lot, I think. And it was during the time when technology was like super like scary, you know, right. like radical. And they were just full in, like they were just like, full send, like yeah. we're doing it. And they were, I mean, they were like, to give you an idea, like 2016, I don't know where you were at that point, 16. Kansas City still. So. Yeah, okay, so I don't know what it was like there, but like right. 2016, it's like Dominican Republic, those kids knew TrackMan data, like, it's crazy. I mean, that was seven, eight years ago, right? And yeah. so that was pretty, it was formative for me and like in the way of innovation and then mm -hmm creating systems and it's probably like some of my strongest beliefs from player development come from that and like they're still pumping up I mean I don't care like whatever you think about Luna or whatever I know it's a huge controversy but he's gone <laughs> and they're still pumping up talent oh, man. from that system one after another you know it's just like incredible to think that like after the whole blow up it's still going so yeah, that system is like really deep oh no it's the, it is and it's it's been successful and that's got to make you feel well equipped as a coach uh, a lot of these like a lot of the older guys, they don't, whether or not you buy into the analytical side or really study the biomechanics of a swing body, whatever, like you still have to know, right? And there's younger players now that that's all, that's how they communicate. That's how they learn baseball. You know, I was at the gym and some young <laughs> oh, kid, God. he's 14 and he's at a tournament and I'm like, how'd it go? He's like, yeah, well, I was spinning my curveball at like 18. And I was, I'm like, oh, shut up, dude. I'm like, come on. So that's what I love, though. You, you're well equipped. Like you said, you said it first. The nerds in the game, you know the nerd stuff. Yeah, well, let's just own it, it right? Like the nerds. Yeah, but at the same time, like the mentality is like, dude, we're gonna, we're gonna win. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so you can relate to any type of guy, and that's what I've always said with Sua with Tampa. It's like. Those guys are ballers, man. Like they, people don't really think, oh, this guy's a superstar or whatnot, but like the information they know is just enough. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. They all have that team mentality where they have that like, hey, we're gonna go in there and win. And I mean, like watching you guys against the Yankees, I mean, that was that was crazy. You know what I mean? A young, small market team goes into New York and you know, there was a good couple years, two, three year run there where Tampa Bay was, they were doing it. So I believe in all this stuff. Yeah. I'm fired up. Yeah, it's definitely, I, yeah. Sorry. Kansas City was all like mentality. I, don't, I really don't even remember getting into the analytical stuff until when I signed with San Diego. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I think we should have done a little more because it is useful, but we weren't living and dying by it. It was just like, hey man, like, yeah, this can help us. This can get us advantages. But at the end of the day, like if you don't have that mentality and you're not showing up every day ready to go, like this all ain't gonna work, right? Like, yeah. I mean, that's just my opinion on it, you know? Both are pretty, like, I mean, that's that's obviously really important. And I'm not sure if, if you can give this away or not, so you don't have to say anything, but like things that I know about the Rays that, for example, just like, they're like ninjas at like picking signs. Is that true? Uh, they're, they're, <laughs> so the Rays, so the Rays, it's so funny. So, he, so the AL East, the AL East is like yeah. the Red Sox, uh, the Yankees, the Blue Jays. And so it's one of those things when you know a team does it, like you're, you're like paranoid. It's like everything a team does, oh, they're picking our signs or any <laughs> yeah. kind of movement. And so if you were to ask the Rays, if you ask the players and the staff, we would think or the Rays would think that they're not very good at doing it. And but obviously, I think every team has their ways of going about it. But in-house, they oh, probably there, think, oh, teams. We, we think we're oh, average. At the minor league level, they were ninjas. Oh, really? I don't know. They were oh, like, really? they, they were, you know, you see the guy second base, he like tugs his thing, you're like, like How just check constantly. That? I know. <laughs> but I my know point, about yeah, my point is, yeah. is like they're they use like they're they're in my perception they're they're like heavy analytics, but right. also like like you said, like team play Games. hard, you know. Yeah. So there's yeah. like I think both are important, especially when you're a small market team. Like you have you have to have every edge possible, and so that's probably what, a little bit of what I picked up with Houston too. Is like they were nobody, mm. you know, incredibly low payroll, like shocking low, low payroll. And now it's like getting every edge that they possibly could. And so it's part of what I'm excited for with the Marlins as well is like, we have to do it. We have to do everything. Mm. You're so right. do everything. You have to do it. You have to do it. You can't yeah. two guys do it or the three and four hole hitter does it. All the best teams, everybody is doing it. Like it's a system. Like that is, it's a system. You yeah. And if you don't buy in, I feel like a lot of these teams, these good organizations, they're like, hey, we're gonna find someone that does. Mm-hmm. and. I mean, like you said, I've, I've always felt like I can see something different, but I could never pinpoint like if a guy's tipping. But dude, I've been on teams so where they have people that are just hired to be in the locker room. They're studying the pitchers for the, the mm-hmm. series that we got next. And they are there all day trying to find tips. They're trying to learn the sequences they use at second. And this is all stuff that goes into like the pregame meetings and all the good teams have that edge you're talking about. So you got it, you have to do it. Yeah, so there's those some players matter. who want to know what's coming. And then there's some players like, don't tell me. Don't don't tell me. Were you like, were you a guy? Did oh, you... tell me every time. <laughs> tell you every time. <laughs> hey, tell why do you me. think some guys, why if, are some as guys soon like, as I, I don't want to know. Signal fastball to me, I'm swinging right now. <laughs> he hadn't even thrown it yet. And I'm swinging, buddy. I'm coming. Let's go. Uh, why do you think some guys don't want to know? So Lorenzo Cain never wanted to know because he felt like it would get him too jumpy. Like if he knew a pitch was coming, like a, say he knew a slider was coming and that pitch recognition you're talking yeah. about, yeah. as soon as he would see that, like it would make him like jumpy at it. He just wanted to react to it. But how about you? I needed, I would love to know. I mean, I don't, I, so from a pitch recognition standpoint, I can understand why guys don't want to know. Cause like you said, they might mess up or they might, yeah. they might think it's a fastball and then they think they see this, you know, or, or, or this and like get thrown off. So. I don't know why that is, but I mean, I, I would imagine this, that you would want to know. Like, no doubt. I, yeah. I don't know. Right. Yeah. It just increases the no your circumference there's, of luck. Yeah. Just oh, like, yeah man. Just, How many times uh, do you swing and miss in batting practice? I mean, I would say maybe once every other year. And that's <laughs> exactly. something that went really, really terribly wrong. <laughs> because you wrong. know where it's going to be, you yeah, know, or even yeah. if you were to say, like, I don't know how much you used like machines in your in your career, but even like a big hack machine, 96 fastball, a guy might like swing and miss, you know, once a day on that because mm-hmm. you know it's coming. So like the speed and the movement, if you know where it's gonna be, presumably, although I haven't faced it myself, it seems like based on results, if you know what's coming, even if it's nasty, like makes it a lot easier than if right. you, 
you're guessing and you're waiting for that like recognition yeah. halfway there. We had in Chicago, they would do the bat fitting stuff and yeah. we would have it in the back of the cage. And a lot of guys were like, uh, we had the traject too. It was like a, it was a screen, pitchers throwing and it's throwing, you know, 95, 96, you can set it to whatever. And I thought it was really smart because a lot of guys were like, I want to test the bat in a live at bat on the traject. But there's something about that game swing. Like it's a little, it's just a little different. And I thought that was pretty cool. I told you we faced one particular pitcher with the Pirates and he was up there the whole spring. So we got about a month and a half of seeing him on the traject. <laughs> And we're like, this guy's got no chance. We face him. <laughs> and we put up like seven and two innings. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, we were just preparing for like a month straight, you know, so. I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Like if you, you're you seeing a more realistic representation, you know no what doubt. it is, BP is. For your timing, yeah. Nice, but. The foam balls were really cool too, because a lot of teams started using those machines and they would put it at like 120, 130 miles an hour and you're not blowing your hands up but you're in there and you're trying to do it. And then you get to the game and it just slows everything down. Yeah, That's the coolest thing I think hitting, what I've learned is like trying to find the most uncomfortable positions for a hitter to be in. And like those drills, man, they just get you going. And that's how I think you learn a lot from that type of stuff. So what about like, I mean, okay, just genuine question here. So yeah. guys who are like, oh, I just wanna like feel good. You know, before they, I just wanna feel good. I don't wanna do that stuff. So for me, you have to earn that. Like if Manny Machado comes up and tells me that, Manny's been doing it for 12 plus years now, has been very successful, has proven, you know, not only to be good, but, but he posts, he's durable. He's out there for his team, 160 of the 162 games. So I'm more than okay with a guy like him doing that because he's earned that right. But younger guys and guys that haven't really proven to be durable one or, or have, you know, the a routine that's really successful for them, I think you gotta be open to change, you gotta be open to adapting, and something we we were always talking about is your routine changes, you know, as a younger player, trying to build some strength and, and get strong, and then as an older player, you're trying to stay healthy, and it's more of, you know, the training room time rather than the weight room stuff, but you have to adapt. You gotta be willing to at least try something new, and then if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. One thing that you hear often in the big leagues is players will say, it's not until the big leagues where you finally, everyone on the team is focused on winning the World Series. Like mm. we're, we are, the job is to win a World Series. Yes, you're gonna have your occasional guys, contracts and so forth, but collectively win the World Series. And they talked about how difficult it was to do that in the minor leagues oh, because so hard. they want- Girl. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. They want to just get to the next level. They want to get to the big leagues. Right? We don't care if we win high A championships. We want to get to the big leagues. How do you build a culture of camaraderie and teach guys to be good teammates in the minor leagues when they're not in the incentives aren't right? Like they're not incentivized to be a do good teammate. Do you want to go first or you yeah, want how to do you, go? How do you think about your minor league teams you've been on? I mean, I mean and, how can you not as a minor leaguer? Like, I, I completely get it. Like, your, your team's winning, everybody gets promoted, you don't, you're gonna be a little bit bitter at the end of the day. But I will say, how can we create that team atmosphere as much as possible? So if, if Rachel's my manager and I see her kicking dirt in the umpire's knees, arguing a call for me, or even the farm director's in town and I have two bad days and you know you go to bat for me, it's like, hey, listen, he was, he was off these couple of days, but this guy's a player. Like, if I know and feel that my manager has my back and will go to bat for me, like that's gonna bring out something a lot more in, the, in that competing, winning, that atmosphere or that attitude, because I want you to have success just as much as you want me. But it's natural for a player to have that, like I wanna move up, I wanna make it to the big leagues, I'm not making any money, I need to make up, I need to make some good cash. Like I couldn't imagine that as a manager. I, now I'm thinking about my question and my statement about <laughs> the strength coach to hitting coach being the biggest jump, and that was a pretty dumb thing. <laughs> yeah, but now thinking, you're talking about the manager. Okay, think wait. about being the director of player development. Like she, she's like, like, okay, how are you gonna shape? What are you gonna do? Wait, hold on. Let's not get too far off of this question. <laughs> yeah, one question at a time, guys. Hold on. Started that one out. That's on yeah, me. Hold on, hold on. That's so funny you say that. I would have gone just straight to what I really hope to implement as soon as I'll just say as soon as possible. This seems very simple to me. Pay minor league players incentives for winning. Why is that so hard to understand? 
What you just said though, like you, you centered around still individual, right? You're like, oh, I would work hard to like move up or I, I have this relationship with a manager and that would motivate me. But what he asked is a winning culture, which is different than what you said. Not that what you said is wrong, but like- I had a terrible answer. <laughs> no, <laughs> I do, but I just didn't. That's what I said, actually, that's a horrible answer. You, you're not a good listener. You said, <laughs> anyway, so he said, he was asking about the winning culture, which I don't have to tell you is very different than like, I want to do well, so I move up. It's like that team vibe. And when guys, and I, I don't know what your experience was, but like when guys are after each other, like cut throw, like, hey, f- and run hard, you know, yeah. and it, that doesn't happen at the minor league level because it's not about the team winning. It's about like, I don't care if that guy runs hard because good. Mm-hmm. I get a spot, like good, I don't care. Mm-hmm. It's genius. It's, yeah. it's like- Playoff shares for the big Money. Leagues. Yes. Playoff money. shares. I mean, you got guys making- Incentives. Yeah, you're, no, you're exactly right. You got guys in the big leagues making $30 million and each round you advance in the playoffs is a better bonus and that drives them. The minor league guys, a, a playoff share bonus for them is absolutely genius. But also like, and it, it's, it'd be a bit harder in the minor leagues, but there's like, like literally just monthly winning percent. I just think you should probably do that at the major league level as well because it's such a long season. So like preaching the choir, but you can, if you're not on the right team, you can easily be like, ah, like it's a long season, like chill in April or whatever. Like obviously if you're a playoff contender, you have a great culture, people are out the f-ing gate, but mm-hmm. it's like, it's so long and there's so many games that people can get them in the mode of like, eh, like, okay, I'll wait till August and then we'll like push it out. And I think minor league level, that's just exacerbated, right? It's, it's just so long with nothing at the end of it. Like we might, we might get a ring for a minor league championship. Like who cares? Sorry. If somebody cares, I'm sorry. But like <laughs> money, give them incentives. I don't yeah, understand. Yeah. And so, coming out of the gates, you're right, because uh, Ned Yost used to tell us, he was my manager in Kansas City, one year in Atlanta, they won like 94 games and didn't win the division. And I think this was before the wild card era. And he's like, when did that one game happen? Was it a game in April where we were slacking off? Was it June? Like, don't say it was just September when we decided to turn it on. It's like, you got to be steady the whole year. There's one time I was uh, the director of mental performance at the IMG Academy, and uh, and I would go to the different employees. We were talking earlier about love languages, and uh, so I went to oh, different. Empl- we went to different. Yeah, Digging we get deep, deep here. Yeah. We, we yeah. dig deep yeah. here. Yeah. We don't need to get to that one. <laughs> and so we. Um, Rachel so, got up out of her seat. She's like, all right, <laughs> tell me more. Let's so go. So I went to one of our mental performance coaches. I was like, thank you so much for your hard work, and I really, I just acknowledging all the work you're doing behind the scenes. And I'm coming in, and he's looking at me, and so he goes, he goes. Thank you, Justin. He goes, but, but thank you won't pay for my phone bill. And he goes, I just need to get paid more money. I was like, noted. <laughs> I was like, noted. You're right. But that's that's so true. Now, with that, so that is ideal, and I agree. I think incentivize them for for winning. I think you will see a huge shift in effort, and it's going to shape the culture. Well, that's not the case going into this. So it's not the case. How do you, how do you even try to do that without incentivizing? It's a whole other podcast, dude. Okay. (laughs) Try some play. So I've I've done this for probably like the past five years, but there's something called the competitive cauldron. You might have like Anson Dorrance. Are you familiar? Yes, yes, yes. You know who that is? Who? (laughs) (laughs) He's one of the most successful coaches of all time across all sports. UNC yeah, soccer. No. Oh, UNC soccer. He's, even got the name he's one of the most <laughs> successful yeah, coaches across all sports in the history of sports. Um, but he coaches women's soccer, so that's why you don't know him. UNC oh, women's soccer. Me, yeah. Me and him. You know. Me and him. I'm enjoying this. I'm getting the popcorn. Yeah. You think I've been in Provo for 12 years? I don't I want to talk it. shit. I love it. Okay. I love it. All right. Anyway, I digress. So he um, he got this from Dean Smith, uh, UNC basketball when he was like a young coach at UNC and he, it's called the competitive cauldron is what he calls it. So basically like the, in the current format that I use it in the minor leagues, because there's the issue that you just described, I will separate guys into teams like individually. So let's just take like position players, for example, separate them into three teams of four, cause that's about what you have on a team. And then you give points, right? So over the course of, I usually put like a month to five weeks because the season is so long. So I'll do like, five to six weeks, somewhere in there, and you assign points to things. And so this is especially important if the team sucks, okay? So this is very important. So if we're not doing very well and everyone's like, uh, you know, like that down feeling, to create some kind of excitement and focus on the process and like the individual things that they're doing really well. 
So like basically, for example, really easy example, right? You um, hit a ball over 95 miles an hour, like a very simple example. You get a point for your team. And so even if we lose, there's guys that are like, you know, they'll hit like an easy single and they're running down the line. They're like, give me my point, you know, because like at the end of the five weeks, um, within reason, like I can't pay all these guys a lot of money, but like I have like a Nike sponsorship. So I gave them like enough to buy a pair of Jordans like each for each of those players on that team, whoever won. So like they would get 250 bucks of Nike money if that if their team won. So that that's like the positive stuff, right? They get points for over 95 or like a walk or whatever it is. And then also what's really cool, and again, you do not see this, I don't believe, until you're on like a true playoff contending team, probably year after year, honestly. Like the cool thing is, is then you don't have to punish anyone. You just take points away. So if you don't run down the line to first, that's like max points, right? You're like minus 10 points. And then everyone's like, run to first. <laughs> what are you doing? Like, or, there, or like if you're late, right? So it, turn guy, it turns guys into like, there's so much immediate like peer accountability because they want the money or they want the, the Nike money. That's a great point. Competition, like you drop <sighs> any kind of competition. Oh, anything. It was so funny, our, 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 our position players, they didn't want to practice bunting. And so what their hitting coach decided to do, we're gonna turn it into competition and, and there was gonna be a pot for it. I mean, these are millionaires, or it doesn't, <laughs> like, but they just want to compete. Yeah. And they competed in front of the opposing team and so fans, so it was neat, but I, lo I love that. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. You could yeah, put yeah, a t-shirt on it, people lose their minds. Yes. You know, it's <laughs> like, it doesn't for matter. anything. It's like, better if you have a good prize, but yeah. like you really don't have to have that much. And people yeah. just like the ego, you know, it's just it's so it's like so controlling. That is that is so true. I, I want to read. I want to read something that you said. This, oh God! This, oh, your, I your, can't wait for your, oh uh, your your <laughs> words. Your words. This is your okay. quote. Okay. okay. Yes. You said this. I'm not the first woman to have a position in baseball, but I know this is a little different. I'm a product of the women who have come before me in sports. If somebody thinks I'm a trailblazer, great because hopefully that's creating an opportunity to think it's possible for others. Now, I'm gonna add this, I mean, I, I'm gonna add another thing that I just read, um, just came up, a poem. And I want you to get, I wanna, I wanna hear your thoughts about this poem because it aligns with this. And I wanna get your thoughts of this. Our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? As we let our own light shine, we will unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. Where did this come from? Like how your light and ability to shine and be your authentic self, where did that come from? You know, only only Justin Sua has like a quote, and then he's like, "Oh, a poem just popped up." <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's the first poem he's busted out yeah, so first, far, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Trying new things out. Like, where did that even? Uh, um, yes. Okay, where did it come from? I think. Okay, so yeah, giving this quite a bit of thought, but I think it started in the home for sure. And my parents are pretty like practical. I'm from Omaha, so like real like practical like Midwest humans and um, the early years of my career were pretty like painful for them because it was so impractical. Uh, but at the same time, what's interesting is they never like, they never told me I couldn't do anything. They always were like, you can always, you can do it if you earn it. And that was like everything in my life, right? It was like, you know, hey, you want to, you want to buy something? Like get a job, figure it out. Uh, okay. You want to like go play division one softball? Like Okay, are you gonna pay for the cages that you're gonna go hit in? Okay, cool, like go do it. Like earn, it was just like, you can do anything if you earn it. There was no other rule, really. Like unintentionally, I think they, did, they didn't, if they had known what I, was, was, what I was gonna do, they would probably try to talk me out of it. So, <laughs> but it was just always like, yeah, okay, cool. You wanna do it? Like, I don't care. I'm, I have two sisters, so my dad has three daughters, right? And he just raised us like we were people, right? Like we mowed the lawn and we changed the oil in the car and just, I didn't even think that I was different until I got to like a certain point of adulthood when people were like, oh yeah, like we don't hire women in baseball. That was like a shock to me. I didn't understand, I was so naive. And so I think it was that naivete growing up that I didn't know that I couldn't do it until I was old enough to where, you know, somebody told me and I was like, oh, that's nice. I'll see you next year. <laughs> like I was so naive. And so again, just being that, that's the part of my career. But then also there's, 
Uh, I want to speak like a little bit to a, you didn't directly ask me this, but the light shining and, and hopefully like even in this conversation, just like my personality or just, you know, I'm talking with my hands, I'm like really excited and um, early in my career for sure, I was, I would try to like dumb that down and be quiet or uh, wear certain clothes that like didn't show my body too much and they only had men's clothing at the time so that was easy so just men's men's larges just cover everything right up you know <laughs> but at a certain point I was like this is really it's like limiting for me to show just one side of myself that was really like lacking femininity and lacking like pieces of me who I really am and with time I thought it was now I think it's extremely important. Like every interview I do on television, I'm gonna have my hair down and my makeup on, whatever, because I hope some young young girl out there can relate to that. And now there's other types of, of women or people or whatever, but for me, I wanna show like the most authentic version of me, because what, what if I'm changing it and then some person out there that really needs to see somebody like me doesn't. They don't, they don't get that. So, I think it's, I feel it's almost like a, a duty or something that I'm like, I need to really show who I am so that somebody out there who needs to see that will see it. That's awesome. It is. That's inspiring. I mean, it must be nice to have a Nike deal, by the way. We'll that one <laughs> deal. But it, it honestly, it My seems, bad. yeah. <laughs> big deal. It seems like you could have had a lot more deals coming your way. You could have had a lot more attention coming your way, but from what I'm getting, like, you just want to work. You just want to win. You want to just, mm. just go and like, let's strap up every day. Let's get, take BP. Let's go win a ball game and, and let's do that, which is awesome. But like inspiring to me, like, so now post playing career, not playing anymore. I feel like I have so much knowledge and I have so much to give back and like stuff like that inspires me to do this. Yeah, and 100%. So that's awesome, by the way. You, the mentality, the, you know, anytime you get some credit coming your way, you deflect. So it really is like for me, being an older baseball soul, to know that that's being preached in the minor leagues again. And again, you're well equipped, you know that stuff. But deep down, you're a winner and you're preaching that. That's awesome stuff. That's, <laughs> that really is. That really is. That makes me, like I told you with Alyssa, how my niece saw that and called me. Right. That, like, gave me a whole new perspective and that is cool because now you do this stuff and you're awesome enough to come on here and she sees that that's going to continue to make that dream a reality for her and, and know that it could happen you know so thanks for going. sharing that no no no. keep going that's good that's, to know thank you is, yeah most going. of the time it's like players with daughters you know but the niece thing too like players with daughters i never know how a player is going to feel about me really and then if they're like oh have a daughter. I'm like, oh, like thank God. Like, okay, you're you're like on board with this. You are you okay with this? But the niece, like, or even like, oh, my sister played softball in college, or my, you know, there's like that little connection, and I know that it probably sheds like a different light on, on, you know, more women being in the game. No question. No like question. I said earlier, like it's it's for somebody that needs to see it, mm -hmm. and somebody needs to see you doing this and and listen to you, and and they look up to you. So it's incredible. And you too, Justin. Thank you. Good, good great job. Poem. Great <laughs> poem. Great <laughs> poem. Omaha, awesome. great zoo in Omaha, yeah. huh? Is that like, AAA, I was is that out there. Is that all you can say uh, about Omaha? Hey, That's all you can say about Omaha. I mean, I'm not going to say Rosenblatt was great. Uh, yeah. Omaha's AAA. There's not many people that are happy going to AAA. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that's right. We Omahans love Rosenblatt. No, I do love Rosenblatt. I, I want to make that clear. We were, the year I was in Omaha was the first team they moved out to Papillion, okay. the new stadium. And I scored the first run. Oh, sorry stadium. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about is it. your name on the stadium? It that, should be. It should be right that, on home plate. Is, yeah. 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 <laughs> is that your biggest accomplishment? <laughs> I mean, we all don't have Nike deals, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs>